Hello, Rush Church. Uh, I hope this is another good Wednesday or happy Wednesday. I hope it's been one, depending on when you are partaking of this particular study. Um, I, I miss you guys, and hopefully we'll all be together soon. Um, but in the meantime, I've been wanting to, thirsting really, uh, to continue to do some Bible studies with you to break down some of the things we see in Scripture. I know that Brian is going to start a Bible study. I think his is going to be, um, I, I don't remember if his is going to be on Facebook uh, or how he's going to do that. In fact, it may be a an interactive type of um, you know, Zoom platform that he's going to use. <clears throat> But he's going to study through the book of Romans. Um, I, I want to study from another book, and, and I want to do this mainly for because of the fact that we're not together. And we can continue to learn, we can continue to study and get in depth. Where this is going to go, I have no idea. This is, this is day one of this, and this whole thing here is really new to me. It's probably uh, very simple to a lot of you. Maybe you've been using this type of thing before. But I haven't, uh, so it's new to me. Um, and, and again, when we all meet together, we'll come back um, hopefully sometime in May. Uh, I may continue to do this. I'm going to try to have one of these every Wednesday uh, posted to the website. This is going to be, like I said, uh, on the website. But what I would like to do as this changes and progresses and moves forward uh, I'd like to figure out and determine whether this should be a little bit more interactive with this study. Um, and so what I'd like you to do, if, if you've watched this, if, you, if you've seen this, first of all, tell people about it. All right, call people up. Say, hey, make sure you get involved in Brian's study uh, with Romans. Make sure you see you know, John's study here in uh, and uh, we'll look through Matthew. Please make sure you do that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, on the website, on the, on the main page, uh, you can go to your left, and you see a bunch of tabs there. Underneath the, of those tabs, there's one tab that says Leadership. <clears throat> if you click on the Leadership, uh, you'll find the elders of the church, and under that, under one of those, uh, you'll find my... Uh, email uh, John W at rushchurch.com um, just go ahead and email me and give me some feedback on uh, not so much the form okay we're, we're we're working through that we'll we'll try to refine that the picture sound I mean all that stuff uh, but really just whether or not you would prefer doing something a little bit more interactive uh, once we get to if we ever do, uh, get to a Facebook live type of thing with this study. It's a little bit harder getting a decent picture. It's certainly harder getting decent sound, uh, a lot of stuff like that. So that's why we just want to start out with a pre-recording here on the website. Again, this may go may go for weeks and months. And who knows? This may just be a regular part of being a part of Rush Church to dive into some of these studies. Uh, but today I want to start in Matthew, and we're, we're not, the, the purpose of this, or really kind of the way of this study, is not to accomplish certain things. It's not to hit certain benchmarks or accomplish, you know, so many verses or so many chapters. Uh, I really want to look at the words of Jesus uh, in Matthew, starting with Matthew chapter 5, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. There's a reason I want to do that. I really begin to break down exactly what it is he's saying. I think a lot of us have, have read the Bible. I think a lot of us have read <clears throat> either the Bible straight through or many different parts of the Bible. And if you put all those parts together, probably, probably we have read it straight through. Uh, sometimes we read a little quickly. Uh, and we miss, I think, sometimes the significance of the words and really even the form of how and why Jesus uh, says what he says and, and speaks the way he speaks. And so um, 
I think the Sermon on the Mount is a great place to start. Why there? You can start anywhere, right? Uh, I think the this particular message that Jesus gives us um, is a couple things. Number one, it's immediately applicable. You know, there's so many things that we see here in the Sermon on the Mount, and now we can reflect upon our own lives, our own our own minds, our own attitudes, and we can begin to see if what we do, what we strive to do, what we follow, if that begins to line up with some of the things that Jesus talks about. The other reason I like to start the Sermon on the Mount is we are familiar with it. Uh, you've either heard of the Sermon on the Mount, you've probably done some studies through it, heard some messages about it, and uh, so we're, we're kind of familiar with some of the things Jesus is going to talk about. Even though we're familiar with some of the things Jesus talks about, there are things in this particular uh, part of Scripture, but really through all Scripture, that can be hard to hear. Uh, they can certainly be hard to obey. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of things Jesus says that kind of goes against um, well, our, our pride, uh, our culture, um, that's what Jesus was. He was against uh, a, a lot of things that were happening even in his day, in his culture. Um, and so some of these things are hard to hear. You know, we are going to talk about adultery. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about uh, generosity. We're going to talk about giving. And, you know, it, Jesus addresses all of these things. Uh, so... It, it, it requires, I think, putting a little bit of our uh, preconceptions on hold and opening our minds completely, just, just kind of a blank slate, and really listen to the words that Jesus is going to say. He's a smart guy, trust me. Uh, he knows. He knows our lives. He knows our hearts. Even though he was ministering uh, here uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, uh, he's alive and well today, uh, knows full well our culture, our different families, all of these things that we have. And so um, it, it really is going to benefit us, <clears throat> I think, to apply these things to our life, to listen to what he has to say, make sure we realize it and understand it. Uh, just to set the stage a little bit for the Sermon on the Mount, uh, this is not at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Although it would, it would fit very well, I think, at the beginning of his ministry, because he is kind of, I don't know, he's really kind of introducing himself, it seems like here. If he's not introducing himself, he's introducing this new way of thinking. Uh, he's introducing the fulfillment of the law. He's introducing um, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so it would fit very well at the beginning of his ministry, but it's actually not. This is... This is done during the height of his popularity, somewhere in about the second year of his ministry. Now these timelines are, you got to take all those with a grain of salt, but uh, this is about, uh, you know, in the second year, beginning of the second year of Jesus' ministry. And so at this point, there's actually quite a few people that are following Jesus, quite a few people who want to hear what he has to say. Trying, trying to apply these things to their lives, he, he came along with, um, with freedom. You know, he, he, he came along with value. He came along with sort of a breath of fresh air. Remember, people were being, at this time, they were kind of under the thumb of the Romans. Um, but this, this group of people that's following Jesus right now, um, this is a, a largely Jewish uh, group, uh, Matthew is writing to a Jewish uh, audience. And so these folks are not only under the thumb of the Romans, they're also a little bit under the thumb of the Jewish leaders. Sometimes they're not getting it right, you know, and sometimes they uh, either either make some mistakes in their interpretation of the law, their application of the law. Uh, sometimes they're just downright uh, doing the wrong thing, the bad thing. And these, these, these people, these groups of people are, uh, to a certain extent, being oppressed uh, by a number of, of, of people, a number of different factions. And so they're looking for something. They're looking for something that gives them hope, looking for something that gives them freedom and value. 
they're also looking for for meaning in life. I mean, that's that's what we all look for. Uh, and not only does this give us meaning, it gives us it even gives us structure structure that we can live inside of and work inside of. It's not structure with hard lines on it. Uh, it's very much like a body. I've probably said this before. Your body has form, but it can also move and it can be squeezed and stretched a little bit, if you, you know. And that's, that's a lot of what the kingdom of heaven is like. There's not these hard edges and hard rules, uh, but there are these structures and forms and way of thinking, these attitudes that we should have. And how do we get those? We get those by dedicating our lives to Jesus. And that's really what it is. We accept the Lordship of Christ in our lives. And that begins to shape uh, our actions, our thoughts. That begins to shape our attitudes. Uh, you know, I think very much as a, as a marriage you know, we are called, the church is called the bride of Christ. And and when you when you get married or when you, you know, fall in love, as it were, with another person, even even your life begins to change because of this dedication you have to another person, because of this love that you have, this connection that you have to another person. And that's really kind of the same thing. You 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 are you know falling as it were in love. You 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 love Jesus, you love uh, who he is and what he is and your life then begins to revolve around that and begins to take shape none of this that we're going to talk about um, none of this is to earn salvation that, that's never been the point that has never from, from day one that has never been a reality that by doing good things or being a good person I mean there's a point at which Jesus is called good teacher and even Jesus turns around and says look nobody's good there's anybody who's good but God alone. Um, by being a good person, we don't earn salvation. We don't earn Jesus' love. Uh, we, we, this is all a gift that Jesus has given his creation. You know, we either accept that gift or we reject that gift. Now, practicing the things that Jesus talks about, obeying his commands. He says, if you love me, you're going to obey my commands. Obeying his commands does draw us closer to Christ into a deeper um, relationship, but really into a deeper appreciation for who he is and what he is uh, and, and the results of this Christian walk, this Christian life. But in no way does it earn salvation. It doesn't, it doesn't earn his love either. There's not different levels of love. Um, he loves his creation, loves his children, just you love your children. And uh, he wants his children to be saved. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he conquered death for us. Uh, and so these are all kind of results of giving your life to Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. They are, he's laying out what the law means in this, under this new covenant, the fulfillment of the law. And, and you'll, you'll hear as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus will start something uh, by saying, you've heard that it was said. Well, that tells us a couple of things. Number one, it tells us he's talking to a Jewish audience. Number two, it tells us he's referring to the Old Testament law. Okay, you've heard it said, but now here's what it really means. Here's how you actually live that out. Here's what, here's what that was always supposed to look like. And that's what he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount fascinating study um, it's an incredible moment of, of preaching and teaching um, there's no evidence to suggest that this was uh, you know an hour or two or three hour long lesson uh, not even a day uh, this could have happened in in an hour or two or three it could have happened over three days uh, the way things are written here we don't know that uh, but it is an incredible moment incredible time that we can look into and we can learn, we can, uh, hopefully we can grow from. I don't know how far we're going to get done today. I'm going to keep this at an hour. So the next time we do this next week, we're going to be in Scripture a lot more instead of having just this introduction time. Uh, but uh, we're going to try to keep it at about an hour. I've got the clock sitting over here, and it's really informal. I want to try to do the whole thing 
uh, with one recording instead of having to edit or anything like that. Uh, so, hey, look, if mistakes happen, mistakes happen. Someone comes in the door, well, they come in the door. Uh, that's just the way that's going to go. And, and I think that's really the way some of these studies ought to be. We can do the formal kind of lecture, uh, you know, preaching on Sunday morning. Um, but this is more of an interaction. And an interaction definitely if we end up doing this live. But I want to get into a scripture here very quickly. At first, I just want to ask God to... Um, to allow this, to help this to be productive uh, in our lives. And so if you're watching this right now, um, why, don't, why don't we just pray together, okay? Father, we do thank you for who you are, for what you are, for what you do in our lives. We thank you that you have given us your word, that we have it written down, and that we can, we can, we can just feast upon it as we try to apply these things to our lives. Father, we ask that you do open our eyes, open our minds as we look at the mind of Jesus here. Help us, Father, to fully understand or better understand what it is Jesus is telling us. Help us to apply these things to our lives and realize, Father, that what you want is good. What you want is salvation. What you want is love between brothers and sisters and, and love between us and you. Uh, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're doing this with your Bible, uh, I encourage you to do it with your Bible because I'm not going to have any slides or anything like that. Um, but why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is also recorded in Luke uh, in chapter 6, I think, in Luke. Um, Luke's timeline as he records things are, is really in order as things are happening, much better than the rest of the Gospels. You know, he records this first, and this is early on in Jesus' ministry. Then he records this, and this is a little bit later on in Jesus' ministry, and so on and so on. Matthew, Mark, and John really don't write that way. Um, some of their things are, uh, you know, Matthew may have something in his account of the gospel after the Sermon on the Mount that in real life actually happened before the Sermon on the Mount. And that happens throughout Scripture, and you really got to kind of put those things together if you want to get a full picture. People have done that. Uh, you can find some reputable sources to give you a timeline um, of Scripture. But, but here, the Sermon on the Mount, this is sometime in the second year of Jesus' ministry. It starts here in chapter 5. And I'm just going to read, begin reading here in verse 1. Uh, I'm using the New International Version here. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. First of all, We've talked about these crowds, right? This is largely a, a Jewish crowd, not a Gentile crowd. Uh, they're the ones who really had this first introduction and this first taste of this hope of Jesus. And that's who Jesus really uh, wanted to come to. That's, that's who he wanted to spend his time with. That's where he wanted this message to get across because the Jewish people are have a history of knowing the God of creation or being taught the God of creation. A lot of the Gentiles didn't have that, that history of knowing these things. And so he wanted to get this new message, this new covenant, uh, out to the Jewish people. And of course, then eventually that would spread. That would go from the Jewish nation, from the Jewish people. That would end up spreading to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter was, was instrumental in that. Paul was instrumental in that and begins spreading to the Gentile nation. But these crowds are a largely a Jewish population, and many of them are followers of Christ, disciples of Christ. Uh, remember, we're going to see a lot about this. We're going to hear a lot about the disciples uh, of Jesus. There's really two ways to think of that. There are disciples like you and I are striving to be disciples of Jesus, and that is follow you know, what he does, follow what he teaches, become like him if we can in our character and our thought. And then there are, you know, what we know of as the disciples, uh, this, this group of 12 men uh, that are, are spending a lot of time with Jesus. During that ministry with these 12 men, Jesus comes and goes. They're not always spending time together. But then as his ministry progresses, they spend a lot of time together. And they're, they're traveling with each other. They're going on mission trips together. Uh, they're, they're spending, you know, the day together, the nights together. 
you know, they're, they're, they're living with one another for, for a time. This very, very close discipleship relationship with their, with their rabbi. That's, that's Jesus being the teacher. Um, so there's, there's crowds of people who are following Jesus. Now, in this crowd, you're going to have those who give themselves, their lives, over to Christ, follow his teaching, uh, uh, you know, uh, begin to shape their lives uh, accordingly to what Jesus teaches. But also in this crowd, you're going to find people that, that leave, that ultimately walk away. Uh, there's a point in Scripture where Jesus sees crowds following him, large crowds following him. He turns around and he says, look, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no place in me. You have no, no part in me. And there's a large group of people that say, hey, look, we can't, we can't handle this. This is, this is, whoa, this is way too far. You're, you're, you're going off the deep end there. We're, we're, we can't stick this out. We're, we're out of here. It's one of the benefits um, that we have of living 2,000 years later. We understand that now, uh, that the sacrifice of Jesus was going to be his, his body and his blood. And so it's a little bit easier, I think, sometimes for us to wrap our minds around, um, as opposed to Jesus, a man, turning around and telling people, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Uh, so don't be too hard on them when they say, look, I'm, I'm not sure I can handle this. Uh, but some of these crowds, some of the people in these crowds, these disciples uh, are going to go. They're going to leave, and um, some are going to stick around. Some are going to dedicate themselves to Jesus Christ. Um, and, and it's possible that these crowds actually grew during his time, during this Sermon on the Mount. It, you know, chapter 7, once you get to chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, near the very end, it almost seems to suggest that the, that they went from a crowd to to larger crowds or more crowds. Okay, it's a possibility that this grew over a day or two days or three days that Jesus is giving this message. We don't know that for sure, uh, but it does kind of lend itself to that. Uh, again, the height of Jesus' popularity, many many crowds are following him, and he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Now, for you and I, we should probably call this a big hillside. Uh, this is not the Rocky Mountains, okay? Uh, it's just, it's, it's a, what we might call a very, very, very large hill. Um, actually, this is in the, what's known as the hill country, west of the Sea of Galilee. That's where he's doing this ministry right now. And so there's many of these big hills, call them mountains if you want, um, where he can go up and it almost acts, you know, as a theater, amphitheater type thing. And he sits down and begins to teach. It's a normal form for a teacher, a normal form for a rabbi in that day. Uh, sitting down, having his students you know, come to him, making sure that he can be seen and he can be heard as they, they might be sitting down or relaxing on the, on the mountainside uh, as Jesus begins to teach um, this, this uh, large hillside west of Galilee. His disciples came, continuing on, his disciples came to him and he began to teach. Again, are these the 12 disciples? Well, we have been introduced to the 12 uh, prior to, to this moment. And so uh, these, are, these are the 12 disciples or, or, or the, the close-knit group that Jesus has. But then other disciples, all of those who are giving their lives to Christ, all of those who are pursuing who Jesus is, who are exploring um, this new, this new uh, way of life, new, new thinking, this new covenant. Um, so he begins. And this is where we really get into a lot of the meat of, of the scripture. This is what's known as the Beatitudes. In your Bible, you probably have that title uh, right there above the, the blessed. Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who are more, blessed are the meek. Um, remember, those titles are not a part of the original uh, scripture. They're not a part of the original recording. Most of those titles are put in a little bit later by translators to give you kind of a summary of that particular passage. But this is known as this section, this first section is known as the Beatitudes. That's Latin. Uh, Beatus, I think, uh, means, it means blessed, it means fortunate. And that's what Jesus is going to get into here. The Beatitudes are not, um, that Beatitude form is not unique 
by the way, to Matthew. It's not unique to the Sermon on the Mount. You find this particularly in the Psalms. This way of speaking, this way of teaching would have been familiar uh, to this group of Jewish people. Uh, they're familiar with the blessed are you, blessed are this, blessed is that. In the Psalms, they usually come in pairs. Now, Jesus has quite a few here in the Sermon on the Mount. But if you read through the Psalms, you'll find pairs of those a couple places. Look at Psalm 84. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, just look at Psalm 84 for a second, 4 through 5. In fact, this is a Bible study. Why don't I just do that with you? Psalm 84, it's just a good example of the same type of thing uh, that people would be familiar with. Starting in verse 4, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are set on pilgrimage. That's an example of this beatitude form. Um, and so Jesus begins with that. He knows that. They know that. They're familiar with it. And he's also, I think, really hearkening back to, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a more tangible way, in an upfront way, here in front of you, I think he's fulfilling some prophecy. I think he's fulfilling a prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, there's, there's, there's strong tones of Isaiah 61. Um, let me just turn to Isaiah 61 here, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. In Isaiah 61, we find this. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I really think that these, these types of things, these types of prophecies, these types of thoughts can go through the minds of these original Jewish listeners. I think they can go through our minds as well. Uh, in fact, you may, you may put your finger in that Isaiah 61 as we read through this and see how much of the words of Jesus as he's referring to the kingdom of God, as he's talking about these blessings, how much it, it, it fulfills some of those things that are talked about in Isaiah. Um, so he begins uh, with the Beatitudes. He says this in verse 3, Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is essentially, for our purposes here, fortunate. Fortunate. Um, in fact, I think uh, it's MacArthur that says, Blessed is a divinely bestowed well-being. I think that's, that's a, a great definition of blessed. Some people refer to blessed as joyful. Uh, being filled with joy, having the opportunity to be filled with joy. And I think that's pretty accurate. Um, other people refer to blessed as happy. You know, happy are those. I, I don't think that that's a very good description. Uh, remember, happiness comes and goes. Happiness is really, uh, you know, the, the, an emotion brought on by, by current circumstances. Um, and it's temporary comes and goes. Joy is something that's underlying that can, that can uh, you know, be with us through the rest of our lives. Um, being fortunate because of this, this, this provision and this, uh, this sustaining of God uh, and blessed in that way, that's something that can go with us all of our lives. Uh, being divinely carried, as it were. And so I, I really think that's what this blessed is, this, this incredibly fortunate are you. Not by chance, not by chance, uh, by the work of God, by your submission to the love of Christ, but you find yourselves in a very fortunate position. That's really what he means by blessed. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, two things jump out at me right away here. Uh, when I read that first verse, or actually verse verse 3. Number one is this. The Sermon on the Mount was a big deal. It's a big deal today. This was, you know, if you want to find, if you want to pick a main address uh, to the people, if you want to find a main address to the world, 
you, you go for the Sermon on the Mount. And with as much weight as this carries, and as heavy as this is, and all the stuff that we're going to find in it, the first words, the first line out of Jesus' mouth is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everything, everything in the Sermon on the Mount is connected. All right, it's all, it all builds upon itself. There's nothing disjointed. There's nothing that's, that doesn't rely upon other things. There's nothing that uh, you can uh, partake of apart from Christ. There's nothing that you can, uh, uh, you know, pick and choose. It's all, it all comes together as one picture, as this new life uh, living in the kingdom of God. And so if all of that is connected, all of the Sermon on the Mount, well, that means that all of it's got to be, it has to be connected to this line, this very first line that Jesus says. I mean, this is the hook, right? This is the first thing that comes out of his mouth. This is the attention getter. And so all of this stuff has got to be connected to blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's the first thing that jumps out at me before we even dive into exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Second thing that jumps out at me, of course, is the word poor. Nobody wants to hear that, right? I mean, you don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You know, in, in our time and in our culture, I think probably all times and all cultures, the word poor is something we want to uh, stay away from in our lives. You know, it's, it's viewed as a very bad thing. It's viewed as a very negative thing. Um, and yet, here we have Jesus using the word poor. Um, and with it, telling us that we're very, very fortunate if we are poor in some way. Uh, we, are, we are modeling throughout this message uh, the Christian life the Christian attitude, uh, the Christian condition of the heart, and frankly, Christian priorities. And so this poor in spirit must be important, must be uh, something that we have to hang on. We just got to break this down. So first of all, we see this line uh, that connects everything together. And then we see poor in spirit. So what is this poor in spirit, and how does poor in spirit connect everything together throughout the rest of this message? Poor in spirit is really this. It is a very humble look. It is a very humble recognition um, and addressing the fact that we are spiritually bankrupt without Christ. The poor in spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, is basically the opposite of arrogance. It's the opposite of pride. That's basically what Jesus is saying here. Not only is it the opposite of arrogance and pride, blessed are the poor in spirit is the opposite of ignorance. We are ignorant sometimes of, of our own standing, of our own place, of our own minds, of the condition of our own spirit. Why? Because we, we, we often go through life without specifically addressing, recognizing and addressing the fact that without Christ, we have no hope. We go through life very often thinking, well, I'm an all right guy. Whether I know Jesus or not, I'm an all right guy. Or I'm an all right girl. You know, Paul tells us all the time throughout his letters, you need to examine your life. You need to look at your spirit. You need to look at your mind, your attitude, your actions, your thoughts. You need to look at the hope that you have or lack of hope. You need to look at your certainty for the future. You need to look at what created you and what sustains you, what holds the universe together. Jesus says the poor in spirit begin to recognize this. The poor in spirit realize 
that they need someone or something greater than them for not just eternal life, but to live, work, and operate inside the kingdom of God today. That our entire life hinges upon the grace and love of God our Creator. That's the poor in spirit. It's, it's the opposite of the arrogant. It's the opposite of the prideful. And it benefits us a great deal. When we take stock of our life, when we acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus, when we acknowledge God the Creator, and realize that without them, we don't even have life. With that, Jesus says the same thing in the desert. He's tempted to eat the bread. He's tempted to, you know, to turn the stones into bread. Chapter 4 of Matthew, I think. He says, look, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The poor in spirit realize that. They realize that their spirit, their lives, their existence, their future, their hope, rests upon the love of God their Creator. And so Jesus says, you're fortunate. You're fortunate if you're poor in spirit. We don't like to think of that, do we? We like to think that we are strong in spirit, uh, wise in spirit, courageous in, in spirit. But Jesus says, in and of yourself, you have no hope. In and of yourself, you can't do any of these things. And you certainly cannot make it through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. You, sir, if you're not going to acknowledge the truth of God, if you're not going to acknowledge that you need this type of, of, of sustaining, this sustainment in your life, if you're not going to acknowledge that Jesus is not only the one who forgives, but the one who sustains, if you don't give your life over, if you don't submit to this truth, then the rest of the Sermon on the Mount ain't going to make any sense. I mean, he's basically asking, he's, 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 he's thinning the herd right now. Asking, who is poor in spirit? In other words, he's asking, should I go on with this or not? Are you, are you, are you going to listen or are you not? Have you come to this place where you're poor in spirit? Because if you haven't, a lot of the things we're about to talk about, says Jesus, is just going to fall on deaf ears. It's going to fall on a hard heart. It's going to fall on pride. It's going to fall on arrogance. And so he says, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He is preparing the soil for these people to receive, to receive the words of Christ. He's preparing the soil for these people to receive the kingdom of God. And by the way, this recognition that we need God, this recognition that we are creations of God and that our lives and the hope for our spirit rest solely in God and the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ comes with it a tremendous gift. Not only is there a gift of salvation, but now Jesus follows this up with, blessed are those blessed are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The way this is done, the way this is written, a couple things you need to know. First of all, Matthew uses that phrase a lot, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Um, same thing, these, these are interchangeable, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. <clears throat> the other thing you need to understand is the kingdom, of, the kingdom of heaven was ushered in at the resurrection of Christ. Some could argue, and I think reasonably so, that the kingdom of heaven, heaven was ushered in at the birth of Christ. And, and, and this is something we, we fail to realize sometimes, that we think the kingdom of heaven is something, something future, something that's going to happen, something that we, we, we can't see yet, that we can't know yet. Uh, it, it's going to look different. It's going to feel different. It's gonna, there's going to be this hard line that after this, this life, this physical life ends, then we come into the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's simply not true. 
Jesus, Jesus never teaches anything like that. Now, there is the there is the completion of the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. And that's after that which is evil is done away with. But the kingdom of heaven is now. The kingdom of heaven is today. The kingdom of heaven was ushered in at the resurrection of Christ. This kingdom of heaven that he talks about throughout Matthew, that Matthew records as the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, that happened then. That happened now. And I suppose you could go back even further those who acknowledged in the Old Testament God the Creator. A part of this kingdom of heaven, a part of this kingdom of God. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is really, I think, where the rubber meets the road. Uh, the rubber has met the road uh, already. First of all, we need to examine our lives. We need to look at our lives and realize that there is a God and, and we're, not, we're not it, right? That we are sustained by God, that we are saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, that we, we are without the, the uh, love of God, without the power of God, uh, we are spiritually bankrupt. Okay, that's, that's number one. The other thing is theirs is the kingdom of God. That is not, um, that's not a guest. Okay? That's not a guest in the kingdom of God. And, and, and even if you want to picture that as the eternal kingdom of God, or you want to picture that as the kingdom of God established now, established here on earth, you need to understand that if you have acknowledged this poor in spirit, if you have acknowledged the need, uh, the necessity of giving your life to Christ so that he can save it, so that he can hold it, so that he can strengthen it, you're not a guest in the kingdom of God anymore. This is yours. Theirs is. That's ownership. Theirs is the kingdom of God. If I'm going to own it, I've got to take care of it. I've got to care for it. I've got to build it. I've got to strengthen it. If I'm going to own it, I have to work inside of it. I, you know, I was... Uh, the other day, mowing the lawn, my house. Ashley was working inside, taking care of things inside. We're owners. If we don't do that, it doesn't get done. So if we've come to this acknowledgement that we have given, we need to, we must, in order to not be spiritually bankrupt, give our lives to Jesus. We now have a responsibility in the kingdom of God. We have a responsibility to live out properly the kingdom of God, which is what he goes into here in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. It's really an incredible privilege that we've been given. Uh, in fact, as Paul says, we become co-heirs, co-heirs with Christ. You're not a guest anymore. You're part of the house. Now with it comes wonderful privileges, wonderful hopes, wonderful certainties, wonderful sharing to be a part of the kingdom of God. But with it also comes responsibility. If you're going to be an owner in the kingdom of God, theirs is the kingdom of God. And we're guaranteed this, by the way. We're spiritually bankrupt uh, without Christ. Then when we accept Christ, when we give this spiritually bankrupt uh, life to Christ, acknowledging that we're poor in spirit, we get something else in return. So we've gotten salvation, we've gotten ownership in the kingdom of God, and we, now we get the indwelling of God himself, only almost exchanging one spirit for another. We're not even out of verse 3 yet. We've got three gifts already. The indwelling of God himself. So we take a bankrupt spirit, we take it, essentially a spirit that's going nowhere. Because at the end of this life, there's nothing, there's nothing beyond us, nothing to look forward to. There's not this eternal life if we have rejected the life giver. So now we've accepted the life giver. Now we've realized that we're, that we're spiritually bankrupt without God, and he gives his spirit to be a part of our lives. God the Holy Spirit. 
So not only are you a part of the kingdom of God, but you are a temple in that kingdom. A temple in that kingdom. You're an incredibly special person. And we're only about that far into the Sermon on the Mount. The things that, the, the meaning behind some of the things that Jesus is going to say ought to shape your life. It ought to shape the way you see yourself for the better, but through humility. It ought to shape the way you see other people. A lot of the people you come in contact with, guess what? They're co-owners in the kingdom of God. They also acknowledge the truth of Christ. They are brothers and sisters in this kingdom. Whether they're a part of this church or not a part of this church building, this, this church proper here. And so it affects and changes the way that we view ourselves, we view others. And we barely scratch the surface of the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think we have time at this point to dive into verse 4. Um, but that's okay. We're not trying to cover everything. Uh, we're not trying to get to certain marks in all of this. Uh, but I do encourage you uh, to go ahead and email me if you want to interact, uh, if you have questions, things like that. Um, I also encourage you next week, we're going to post something on Wednesday. Um, I encourage you to partake of that. It doesn't have to be on Wednesday. It's, it's a recorded you know, video there on the website. Uh, but I encourage you to be a part of that. We're going to get through this. There, there, once we get through the Beatitudes, it's going to pick up. It picks up actually quite a bit faster. Um, because at the Beatitudes, you want to be able to break down each one and really understand what Jesus is telling you. But even in that first one, even in those first few moments, it's begun to shape our lives. And I think you can see through this submission, through this, through this recognition that we need God to keep us from this complete spiritual decay, I really think we begin to see how now the rest of this hinges upon that. It's tied into that. That very first line, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I hope next week you'll join me. Um, who knows? By next week we may have this uh, on Facebook and we may be able to interact and answer questions in real time. Make sure you go to the leadership tab. You'll find John W. at RushChurch.com and go ahead and uh, send me some emails if you'd like to. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, by the way, I'm recording this on Wednesday, so I'll be uh, seeing you guys, or hopefully you'll be seeing us and the worship team uh, this coming Sunday. So we'll see you then.